All right, here we are uh, once again, uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy for Beginners, uh, Faithfulness in the Face of Challenge, that's the name of our series. We are in um, lesson number five, entitled Journey to the Plains of Moab. And uh, Lord willing, uh, today we're going to cover chapters 21 to 27. So let's get into our study. In the uh, previous uh, section of the book of Numbers, uh, chapters 13 to 20, we studied the main arc of both Moses and Aaron's leadership time over the Jewish people. According to the Bible, the Israelites left Mount Sinai on the 20th day of the second month of the second year after their departure from Egypt. Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. During this time, God gave Moses the law uh, and the instructions for building the tabernacle. In addition to this, uh, the people built the tabernacle complex and its furnishings in preparation for setting it up in the promised land, a journey that would have taken only a few months. They built the tabernacle. The idea was they, they built it there at Mount Sinai and they were going to carry it into the promised land and set it up there. However, after sending out the spies to assess the land and upon their return, uh, the negative report of 10 of these men caused the people to rebel and threaten to return to Egypt. In response to this, God punished the people by causing them to remain in the wilderness 40 years, one year for each day that the spies had spent spying out the land. Near the end of this time, that generation, except the faithful spies Joshua and Caleb, died in the desert along with both Miriam and Aaron. Only Moses was left of that era's leadership. Now in Numbers chapter 20, he is told that he also will not enter the promised land with the people because he failed to follow God's instructions to speak to the rock in order to bring forth uh, water uh, for the Israelites at Meribah. Instead, Moses struck the rock twice with his staff. And as a result of this act of disobedience, God tells Moses and Aaron, uh, and we jump ahead to uh, Deuteronomy 32 for this passage, God says, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land uh, I give them. And so God reminds Moses of this consequence and uh, he allows him to view the land from afar before his death. In the meantime, there is still one last leg of the journey to complete in order to reach the plains of Moab, which will serve as a, as a kind of a staging area, if you wish, uh, for the people's entry into the promised land. And this is where we pick up our story in Numbers chapter 21. Now in chapters 21 to 25 uh, of the book of Numbers, um, we have a narration of a series of crucial events as the Israelites journey through the wilderness, approaching the promised land. These chapters include conflicts, uh, divine interventions, prophecies, uh, and moral failures, each reflecting significant themes and lessons for the Israelites. So let's uh, go through each one of these. We begin in chapter 21, the journey to the Transjordan. Now the term Transjordan refers to the area east of the Jordan River, which is now roughly encompassed by the modern state of Jordan. In the context of the Bible, particularly the book of Numbers, the Transjordan is significant as the region where the Israelites encamped before crossing into the promised land and where several of the tribes eventually settled. The Arad victory, which is talked about in chapter 21, one to three, uh, after the Canaanite king of Arad attacks Israel, the Israelites vow to destroy their cities if God delivers them into their hands. This victory signifies God's ongoing support for Israel's conquests. After this, there's the journey to Mount Hor, Numbers 21, 49. A familiar pattern here repeats itself. Right on the heels of their great victory in battle, largely powered by their trust in God to overcome their enemies, 
the Israelites begin to complain against God and Moses about the lack of food and water. In response, God sends venomous snakes among the people and many are bitten and uh, die. As a remedy, God instructs Moses to make a snake uh, out of bronze and set it on a pole and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Moses obeys and those who look upon the bronze snake after being bitten are healed. Again, we read that in Numbers 21, four tonight. Now, before going on to the uh, significance of the snake uh, and its role in healing, I want to explain a theological principle known as type and antitype. In biblical theology, the concept of type and antitype are used to describe how events, persons, or things in the Old Testament prefigure and foreshadow greater truths which are revealed in the New Testament. And so a type, a type is a real historical event or person or object in the Old Testament that serves as a prophetic symbol or example pointing forward to a future event or person. Types are often seen as patterns or models that have both a direct significance at the time of their occurrence and an additional deeper significance when linked uh, to later Christian teachings. Now, the antitype is the fulfillment or the realization of the type in the New Testament. It is often revealed through the person, work, or the teachings of Jesus Christ. The antitype not only fulfills the type, but usually exceeds it in meaning and significance, providing the ultimate interpretation of what the type was originally pointing towards. So let me give you a few examples of type and antitype. Uh, Adam, for example, Adam as a type. Adam is described as a type of Christ in Romans chapter five, verse 14, where Paul calls him a pattern of the one to come. Adam's actions affect all of humanity because of sin, and he serves as a figure of Christ who, unlike Adam, brings righteousness and life to all humanity through his obedience. Another type is Jonah. Jesus refers to Jonah's experience in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights as a sign that points to his own death and burial and resurrection after three days. And he mentions that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. And so the bronze snake therefore serves as a means of salvation for the Israelites, symbolizing God's provision and grace in the face of judgment. It also reflects the consequences of sin and the immediacy of God's mercy when his people turn to him in faith. And so the snake is a type representing this theological idea introduced here in the Old Testament. In John chapter three, verses 14 and 15, we have the antitype of the bronze snake in the New Testament. Jesus refers to the bronze snake in his conversation with Nicodemus. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. John chapter three, verses 14 and 15. Again, the theological significance. Jesus draws a parallel between the bronze snake being lifted up on a pole, there's the type, and his own upcoming crucifixion, the antitype, the analogy uh, underscores that just as the bronze snake was the source of physical healing and salvation from immediate death in the Old Testament, Christ on the cross is the source of spiritual healing and salvation for those who believe, uh, you know, in other words, for those who look upon him uh, as well. So we have some key theological themes produced by the snake type and antitype, and I'd like to share a couple of those with you now. First is salvation through faith. 
Both of these narratives emphasize faith as the mechanism for salvation. Just as the Israelites had to look at the bronze snake to be healed, this was their expression of faith required by God. If you stayed in your tent and just thought about the snake, it wasn't good enough. You had to go and fetch and find where the pole with the snake was, and you had to go look upon it in order uh, to, be, uh, to be healed. Um, in the New Testament, individuals must repent and be baptized. That's in Acts chapter two, verse 38. This is the expression of faith required by God today in order to be saved. Another theological theme is divine grace in response to judgment. The bronze snake was provided as a means of grace and mercy in response to God's judgment for sin. Similarly, the crucifixion of Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's grace in making restitution for our sins and thus offering forgiveness and life in response to the judgment that our sins deserve. And then one more, a symbol of sin and curse. In the Bible, snakes are often symbols of sin and evil, Genesis chapter three, and being lifted on a pole or a tree was a sign of being cursed. We read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Christ's crucifixion, where he is metaphorically lifted up as sin itself and as a, uh, bearing a curse, fulfills this symbolism, taking upon himself the curse of sin to provide healing and salvation to all who believe. It's like how an antidote works to heal a poisonous uh, infection. You take some of the poison and you make an antidote. Jesus took on the sins, the curse, and provided healing for those who believe in him. Typology enriches biblical interpretation by linking Old Testament with the New Testament, demonstrating the unified plan of God across all the scriptures. It helps believers understand how historical events and laws from the Old Testament find their ultimate meaning in Christ revealed in the New Testament. All right, well, let's get back to our chronology of uh, events. Now that we've taken a bit of a side road to explain type and anti-type. Next event uh, is uh, the Song of the Well and the conquests over the Amorites, chapter 21, verses 10 to 20. Uh, so Israel sings a song celebrating the well that was provided by God, and they conquer territories from the Amorite kings Sion and Og. These victories highlight God's direct involvement in granting them success and preparing them for the impending conquest of Canaan. Remember, all along the way, God is preparing the people for what they will have to be doing in, uh, in Canaan. And part of what they will have to be doing is uh, military activity. And so they're practicing, if you wish, this military activity by putting down several of the nations surrounding uh, Canaan at this time. And so the uh, Israelites now control the land east of the Jordan River from which they could prepare to conquer and settle the land on the western side of the Jordan River known as Canaan, as we see here uh, on the map. In chapters 22 and 24, we have an interesting story uh, or account about Balaam, a prophet. It begins with Balak, the king's invitation to Balaam in chapter 22, verses one to 21. Balak, who was the king of Moab, another nation, summons Balaam, uh, a prophet, to come and curse Israel because of his fear that this large number of people will overrun the land. Balaam's journey is marked by an angelic intervention that his donkey perceives, teaching about God's control over all the nations and the protection of his own people. This is where Balaam's donkey answers the prophet when being questioned by him. Numbers 22, 22 to uh, 24, 25, uh, we have the story of Balaam's prophecies. Uh, despite his initial intentions and encouragement by the king to curse the Israelites, in the end, 
Balaam blesses Israel multiple times instead, proclaiming their prosperity as well as their dominance. These blessings reinforce the divine favor upon Israel and God's plan for their, for their future. While specific details about Balak's death or further actions are not detailed directly after the events of Numbers chapters 22 to 24, his name reappears as part of Israel's history in retrospective references later on, warning against similar enmity towards Israel, where Balak's interactions with Balaam are recalled as a reminder of God's protection over Israel. We move on to chapter 25, another event, and that's at Peor, uh, the council against Israel. Uh, despite his prophetic proclamation in favor of Israel during his oracles, Balaam later played a role in leading Israel into sin. He is mentioned as having advised the Midianites on how to corrupt Israel by leading them into idolatry and immorality with Moabite uh, women. And so uh, this began with the Israelite men being seduced uh, by Moabite women into fornication, as well as participation in Baal worship, specifically of the local god, Baal of Peor. Baal was a kind of a, a universal god, universal pagan god, and every city had a version of this God, every city and every region. So in Peor, there was Baal of Peor. The uh, climax of this sinful behavior occurred when a Jewish man actually brought a Midianite woman, this time into the camp and into his tent, thus defiling not only himself, but defiling the camp. This act led to a rebellion with many leaders uh, falling into uh, idolatry and, and caused a severe plague to fall on the entire camp. In Numbers 25, 6 to 18, we read about Phineas, who was uh, Aaron's grandson. Uh, he ends the plague by killing the couple themselves, you know, the Jewish man and the Midianite woman. Uh, he drives a spear through them. And uh, these people who were involved in apostasy uh, uh, could have uh, destroyed uh, the camp. And so uh, Phineas's quick and zealous action earns him a covenant of peace and a perpetual priesthood from God. This act symbolized the importance of zeal for God's law and the impact of righteous actions on the communal uh, well-being. Sometimes you had to act quickly and you had to act decisively and zealously. And this is what Phineas did. Uh, Balaam, by the way, that prophet that caused all this problem, Balaam's end comes when he is killed by the Israelites during a military campaign against the Midianites later on, as instructed by God. His death is mentioned explicitly in number, a little further down in Numbers uh, 31 verse 8. It says, they killed the king of Midian along with the rest of their slain, Elvi, Rechem, Zer, Hur, Reba, and five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. And so these events have particular significance that I'd like to share for you. First of all, it prepared the people for conquest. The military victories and the divine interventions in these chapters served to prepare and to reassure the Israelites of their ability to conquer the land that is promised to them with God's direct support and guidance. Remember, these people were in slavery for 400 years. Uh, they wandered into the desert following uh, Moses, but they had no military training, they had no organization, they had no law, no governors, uh, nothing. And so God is training and preparing them uh, as they uh, interact with the nations uh, around them while they're going through the uh, wilderness. Also, uh, there are spiritual and moral lessons that they learn along the way. The events involving the bronze snake, for example, and Balaam's blessings highlight the themes of salvation, divine protection, and the fulfillment of God's promises. These narratives strengthen the Israelites' trust in God's plans and their spiritual identity. They're saying to themselves, there really is a God. He really is 
taking care of us because they see plainly his intervention in their lives. And perhaps one more, the consequences of disobedience. The incident at Peor illustrates the severe consequences of straying from God's commandments, emphasizing the importance of maintaining purity and devotion amidst uh, external influences, um, which is nothing different than we have to uh, deal with uh, today as well. And so the following chapters, 26 and 27 of the book of Numbers, document significant transitional events as the Israelites prepare for their entry into the promised land. And so these chapters, 26 and 27, focus on a new census, uh, inheritance laws, and the transition of leadership from Moses to uh, Joshua. So here's an orderly explanation of each event along with uh, passage references and their significance. So we begin in chapter six with uh, the second uh, census. And so in uh, chapter 26, God commands Moses and Eleazar to take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans all men 20 years old or older who can serve in the army. This occurs after the plague associated with the Baal uh, Peor incident. Then there's the result of the census, uh, verses five to 51. The census lists each tribe's male population. This new count reflects those who will enter the promised land, excluding the generation that came out of Egypt as they were decreed to die in the wilderness due to their disobedience. Of course, the exception being Caleb and Joshua. And so this census serves to organize and prepare the new generation for conquest and settlement. It underscores a shift from the old generation that experienced the Exodus to the new generation that will experience the conquest of Canaan. Then we have another census, this time for the Levites. In Numbers 26, 57 to 62, the Levites are counted from a month old and above, highlighting their distinctive role and duties uh, separate from military service. Uh, while the land is to be distributed to the tribes, according to the census numbers, the Levites are not to receive a territorial inheritance. Their inheritance, if you remember well, is the Lord himself and the offerings that are given to the Lord. The Levites take a tithe, 10% of all the offerings go to the Levites. And as we learned uh, in past lessons, the Levites would then take 10% of what they received and pass it along to the priests uh, for their own uh, particular uh, support. And so the arrangement reinforces the Levites' special status and duties in the religious life of Israel, focusing on spiritual service over territorial governance. In chapter 27, we have some information about inheritance laws and the transition of the leadership. Uh, in chapters 27, one to 11, we learn of the daughters of Zelophehad, uh, who petitioned to inherit their father's land as he had no sons. God instructs Moses to grant them their inheritance, setting a precedent for inheritance rights for daughters in the absence of uh, sons. This adjustment in the law promoted justice and equity in Israelite society. And what it did was it ensured that family legacies and property uh, would remain with that family even in the absence of uh, male heirs. There's also a succession of leadership, Numbers 27, 12 to 23. God tells Moses that he will not enter the promised land and he instructs him to appoint Joshua as his successor. And so Moses obeys, he lays hands on Joshua before Eleazar the priest and the community Conferring, uh, confirming, uh, uh, conferring rather, authority on Joshua. This transition of leadership is critical for maintaining continuity and stability. Joshua's appointment underlines the importance of godly leadership 
and the need for public endorsement and divine appointment of leadership transitions. Joshua did not you know, appoint himself as a leader. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm, you know, I've been here for the longest time. I've been an apprentice to Moses. It's only natural that I take over. Uh-uh. Uh, in, in, in Israelite society, no one appointed themselves as priests or anything like that. God did that. In the church, it's the same thing. No one appoints themselves as an elder or a deacon. Uh, those individuals are appointed by uh, the church. So uh, these chapters are pivotal as they deal with uh, reorganization and the preparation of the Israelite community for life in Canaan, which is going to be very different from the life that they've known in the wilderness. For example, uh, military victories. The military success in chapter 21 demonstrate God's support for Israel and they signify their growing readiness as a conquering nation, a key aspect of their uh, identity. They will fight many, many wars uh, in the future. Also, it demonstrates uh, divine protection and guidance. Uh, the narrative about the bronze snake, for example, and, and Balaam uh, underscore God's protective guidance and his plans for Israel's blessing, reinforcing their special status as his chosen people. He wasn't, they weren't just his chosen people like uh, you know, on paper, I mean, they were his chosen people. In fact, day after day, he provided for them, he protected them, he, uh, he uh, helped them uh, when, they, when they failed, he forgave them uh, when they uh, made mistakes and when they, when they sinned. And also there were uh, moral and spiritual testing that was taking place while they were in the wilderness. The, the incident at Peor, for example, represents a critical test of Israel's loyalty to Yahweh, illustrating the constant threat of apostasy and the need for vigilance in maintaining covenant uh, relationship and faithfulness. There was also preparatory actions. Uh, the census, for example, uh, prepares the nation for military and civic action in the conquest and the settlement of the promised land. Once they're in the promised land, they have to govern the land, they have to separate, they have to have relationships between the various tribes. And so they're being trained for that. Also, legal and social foundations are being laid, establishing inheritance laws, including those for women. This helped in laying down a more equitable social structure. And then of course, leadership continuity, uh, ensuring a smooth leadership transition from Moses to Joshua helps in maintaining morale and direction as the Israelites stand on the brink of fulfilling the promise of entering the uh, promised land. And so each event in these chapters teaches lessons about God's protection, the consequences of disobedience, and the importance of remaining faithful to divine commands. They collectively mold the character and destiny of the Israelites as they prepare to enter the promised land. And in addition to this, they collectively emphasize readiness, military, uh, legally, and leadership wise. Uh, they had to be ready for the significant changes awaiting the Israelites as they transitioned from being wanderers to being settlers. Okay, so there's the information on uh, several of these uh, chapters. Uh, as always, a couple of lessons that we can draw for our own benefit today from the experience of the Israelites. One of these is that depending on God's provision and protection should always be our first uh, priority. Uh, for example, in Numbers 21, when the Israelites faced the uh, venomous snakes as the result of their complaints and lack of faith, God provided a means of healing through the bronze snake lifted by Moses. This event emphasizes reliance on God's provision, even in punishment or correction. The lesson for us is the importance of looking to God for sustenance, for healing, for protection first, 
especially in times of distress and dissatisfaction with life circumstances. You know, it, it's not faith if our attitude is, well, we might as well pray, it can't hurt. You know, that, that, <laughs> that's not true faith. My point here is that going to God for help first should be our natural go-to move when things get tough. When things get difficult, going to God in prayer first should be natural, it should be instinctive. And this is one of the lessons that we learn here uh, from their experience. Another lesson, God is sovereign over the plans of human beings. Uh, in Numbers 22 to 24, Balaam's intent uh, to curse Israel is overridden by God, who turns the intended curse into blessings. Despite Balak, the king, bes beside his uh, persistent attempts to harm Israel through curses, God's protective hand over his people changes curses into blessings. Again, where's the, lesson for, uh, where's the lesson for us in this? Well, this narrative underscores the sovereignty of God over all human plans and intentions. It encourages Christians to trust in God's overarching plans for their lives even when we don't quite understand, and especially when we don't understand. You see, with God, all things are possible. However, not everything comes with an explanation. You know, that's why and that's how we walk by faith. We don't always have an explanation for everything. This is why our life is built on faith and not simply on understanding all of the details. And then one more uh, lesson, uh, compromise is dangerous. The dangers of compromise and the need for moral integrity. Uh, in Numbers 25, the Israelites engage in idolatry and sexual immorality with the Moabite women, leading to God's severe punishment. We see that Phineas's zealous act in killing the man and the Midianite woman stops the plague sent as punishment, showcasing a drastic but necessary action to preserve the holiness of the community. What's the lesson in that for us? This stark event highlights the dangers of compromising one's faith by confronting the secular and pagan practices that surround us every single day. For Christians, it's a call to uphold moral integrity and remain faithful to God's commandments even in a culture that might encourage contrary behavior. Zeal for God's holiness in an unbelieving, even pagan environment is what creates the light in the darkness. We can't show people the way by compromising our behavior so we'll be accepted by unbelievers. That's what the world likes, low intensity Christians who contribute to the darkness instead of lighting up the darkness. Each of these lessons from Numbers 21 to 27 encourages Christians to navigate their spiritual journey with faith and trust in the divine sovereignty of God and uncompromised moral integrity. Remember uh, that Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, concerning what was written in the Old Testament, he said, now these things happened unto them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages uh, have come. And so Paul confirms that everything we see in the Old Testament uh, certainly happened to the Jews to teach them you know, in real time, but they were also written as an example for us to follow uh, in our Christian lives, uh, in our generation and every generation in the future until Jesus uh, returns. Okay, so that's the end of our class for today. I give you our assignment as always. Now that we've reviewed uh, in detail some of the events that have taken place in 21 to 27, I encourage you to reread those uh, chapters to get all that information into context and then go ahead and read Numbers 28, uh, chapters 28 to 36 in preparation for our next lesson. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you uh, next time if the Lord is willing.